This is GabNet, the Great American Broadcast Network, now in its seventh year. Talk like you've never heard it before. Hey, it's Friday night, and this is The Ramble. I'm Alex, and we go until midnight tonight from the East Coast of the United States of America. Anyway, uh, last time we talked to Larry Bubbles Brown, uh, we came up with a question for ourselves. What was the show that lasted only one episode? <laughs> and as we we were gloating over failure, yeah. And I, I I was trying to remember the show, and, and I thought, well, it had like a a drug related term or a hippie term or something as its title, and it turned out that it was. You were right. We looked it up. Turn on, and it says here in IMDb one episode. <laughs> It says premiere. So the it says title should have been turn off, I guess. On IMDb, it says premiere show and final show. <laughs> uh, how many how many TV series can can make that you know a reality? Uh, yeah. it, it, it seems it, to me that went on in the spring of 1970, but I could be wrong. Uh, let's see here. Uh, 1969. Wednesday, February 5th, 1969. So you're really close. I was a year off. Damn. Yeah. Uh, stars stars on the show. Do you remember the stars at all? Uh, was uh, Teresa Graves on that? You're right. Jeez almighty. God, your memory's terrific. Who else? Uh, that's the only one I remember because I kind of had a crush on her. Tim Conway. Tim Conway. Wow. Yeah, and uh, let's see here. Who else? Anybody? Hamilton Camp. He was a San Francisco person. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, let me see here. I'm trying to remember who. Uh, uh, I can't remember any of the other people. Uh, writing credits. Norman Hoodis. Mark Warren was the director. Chuck McCann. Now, here, Chuck McCann was on it. Do you know a friend Chuck? of yours. A friend of mine. He's the one that told me the story which I mentioned last time we talked okay. to you, which was coming back into the office the next morning, and there was tumbleweed rolling through the offices, <laughs> you know. That's how he described it. And he said, I, I found out the show had been canceled. He said, my one big network break at that time, and it's been canceled. Boom, that's it. Goodbye, see you later, go home. Uh, and um, there were no more. I don't think there were any more produced either. Uh, well, that's, that's incredible that it was one show and done. Wow. Well, well, who's our friend who lives in Sacramento, the comedian? Uh, Jack Gallagher. Jack Gallagher, who, uh, uh, you know, occasionally people might have seen him as the do doctor for Larry David on Curb Your Enthusiasm. But basically, he, uh, he got this job with the network. They said, we want to be in the, in the uh, Jack Gallagher business, as they put it. And they were going to put you in a series. He had no ob objection to it. And by the way, Jack Gallagher, maybe one of the nicest guys in comedy. Am I speaking out of turn? Uh, great guy and a great comic, yeah. A great comic as well. Very funny. But just absolutely nobody has anything bad to say about Jack Gallagher, okay? Nobody has anything bad to say about Larry Bubbles Brown either. So well, we well, Jack, well, he's got that super high likability factor, too. Yeah, and he's a good-looking guy. Yeah. Anyway, they do this sitcom with him. I, I, it may have been called The Jack Gallagher Show, or may, it may have had some kind of title or whatever. But anyway, uh, I'm so happy for him, and I think you remember this situation, don't you? I remember it didn't last long. Well, here's the deal. Here's the deal. This is the this is the one, this is the one that you, as a comic and as a performer and as somebody who who maybe would like to get a TV show sometime, right? Uh, this story will give you the willies. Uh, so they do the series. They do the first episode, right? They've got uh, I think six episodes in the can or something like that, and the 
premiere night was going to be a Monday, I think a Monday night. And they were going to schedule it, or maybe it was a Sunday night. They were going to schedule two episodes one night after another. Big premiere opening for this show. And to even show more confidence, they take out a double-page spread in TV Guide. You remember the old days, TV Guide, yeah. you know, small little, <laughs> small little magazine. But he, if you opened it up and there was a two-page thing, it just went across the whole, you know, uh, uh, magazine. Uh, they take out a full page, two page ad in TV Guide for this thing. Uh, comes, what, the Saturday before the show's supposed to go on? And somebody calls. It's the head of programming at ABC. He says, Hi, this is so and so. It was a female. Uh, uh, I'm the new head of programming at ABC. I just got the job. And I looked at your show, and we decided we're not going to run it. <laughs> oh, God. That's, a, that's the right out of Seinfeld where the woman says, I replaced the... <laughs> yeah. She said that was, that was, a, an, a, that was a, a, a product of the former program director of ABC, and uh, I'm sorry, I don't like the show. So, <laughs> that's exactly what happened on Seinfeld. <laughs> he got canceled before the show ever went on with a two-page ad in TV wow. Guide. And I was so happy for Jack. I tuned in at like 8 o'clock on the Sunday or something like that, and nothing. He isn't there. And finally, I mean, years, about a year later, when I met up with him, I, I said to him, I said, how do you feel about that? You know, I said, if it happened to me, I, they'd have to pull the gun out of my mouth. And he said, you know, you just take it. You know, that's television. That's the business. And you just get on with your life. And he wound up doing a little TV show up in Sacramento on the local station. And I don't know, what's he doing right now? Do you know? Do you have any idea? He's done, I talk to him occasionally, he's done a bunch of one-man shows. Those are pretty good. And he did, he worked for the California Lottery for a while. And he did have his own show yes. in Sacramento. So he's done, he's done fine. Yeah, he's he, got a really, he, ni he's made really a, nice house up there. He ma he's made a nice living. He's had a good life. I think, all things considered, he was Larry David's doctor. <laughs> you know, I mean, he's done stuff, and uh, uh, but never achieved having a you know network comedy show. But I mean, that's the most horrid story I've ever heard. Yeah, that'd be. Uh, but you should have him on. It'd be fun for you to talk to him about that. Yeah, well, I I, I think I did once when he came down and did my show. You know. And I went, eh, you know, he's, he's okay. You know, this is a, he, he, it's too bad uh, that uh, this had to happen, you know. But uh, his life has turned out okay, and uh, his likability factor is still the same, you know. Yeah. So, so uh, uh, yeah, because I wondered, I, I, but I have wondered what happened to him, if he's, if he's still working. Is he working comedy at all, do you know? He does a little, yeah, and uh, I think, you know, I think in that show, I think Jeff Garland was in that cast that nobody saw, but... Oh, really? Yeah. I, I'm just wondering, if I look up Jack Gallagher, you know, you know, the wonderful thing about uh, the the uh, uh, internet... Internet. Is, well, I especially like IMDB. Uh, let me look up Jack uh, Gallagher. Oops. Gal... Oh, here, here's uh, Jack Gallagher. Here we go. Yeah, that he was in Shakes the Clown. That was a film with. Uh, I remember that, and uh, I think a sitcom was that '94. Yeah, on cur four episodes of Curb Your Enthusiasm, uh, he was. Uh, let's see here, uh, Dr. Katz, professional therapist. He, he was on that. Bringing up, oh, bring, was this the show? Bringing up Jack? That day, yeah. Was that it? Uh huh. Bringing up Jack. Uh, and uh, it says all six episodes. So there were six episodes done. And uh, who was on the show? Uh, let's see here. Jeff Garland. Uh, let, me, let me see here. Let's see if you're right. Uh, I could be right. There isn't a Jeff. Uh, Jeff Garland is not listed here. Oh, okay. Okay, but so to show you how 
little IMDb knows of Jack Gallagher. They don't have a picture for him here. Uh, but Matthew Lawrence was in it, Lisa Friedman, and people I don't know. Elaine Lembeck, Marianne, Tom Willett, Glenn Wolf. I, yeah, that doesn't. Oh, all casting crew. Wow, so yeah. Go here, all casting crew. No, he's not listed there. Yeah. But anyway, bringing up Jack, folks, never saw the light of goddamn day. No. Amazing. <laughs> And he probably got that because he did a couple of Carsons. It, I, it, it could be, you know. I mean, you do Carson, you get you're successful in Carson, which I think he was. Yeah, he all oh, killed on there, and uh, yeah, it, it, one of the best TV sets I've ever seen a comic have was the one uh, you hosted, uh, Comedy Tonight, when he. If you I do it, if you do room it, if you, if you do it on a Wednesday, and you kill. By Thursday, you've got an agent. And by yeah. fri- and by Friday you've got a series, mm-hmm. you know that's the way it went in Hollywood at that time. Uh, but I mean, it, it's really amazing to me that kind of story. It only shows how stupid television is, you know, and how executives in television are really dumb. Oh yeah, you know. And then you got to ask yourself the question: Do you want to be in that business? I mean, wouldn't you be better off just trying to do movies, for instance? Or even doing a, uh, a, a part on a existing TV show. Uh, and maybe if they offer you a continuing role on that series, taking that, isn't that better than having a failure like Jack had? And I'm sure it haunted him in the business for many years. I mean, they went, oh, wasn't that the guy that was canceled before the show ever went on? You know, do you want that reputation? You know, and with yeah, the, I would think going with a show that's uh, st- getting a new show off the ground has got to be just almost impossible. Well, first, here are the things you got to do, folks. In case people don't know this, and they should know this, it's all part of what television is. First of all, you got to go in and pitch it, okay? And you got to pitch it to executives who know nothing about comedy, right? The head of yeah. com- the best thing I ever saw there was a show called Episodes, uh, and it was about some people launching a TV show, and they had the head of comedy programming as a character on the show, and she never laughed. She was always <laughs> very grim and always looked like she was smelling farts, you know. And that that's pretty much it, you know. They don't necessarily know anything, but they've got the power over your life. So first, you got to pitch the show to them. And then given that they go, well, sounds like a good idea, get me a script, okay? So then you pour over a script, and then you go back to them with the script, and they take notes on the script and say, change this, change this, change this, and then you change it all. Take all the funny out. Yeah, and then they say, okay, we'll go to a pilot. So then you do a pilot, and that's a full run-through of the show, uh, an example of what it's going to be and you do the pilot and then it goes again through that same process of well are we going to go to series are we not going to go to series and you really don't find that out till the fall when they decide what shows they're going to put on their schedule so i mean it's it it's just arduous you know rather than the reason netflix why performers love to go to netflix and get things approved is they go to them pitch them an idea and they say good go ahead and do it wow you know there's none of this oh well then we got to go to pilot and then we got to wait and see if we're going to put it on or not no and that's why they like netflix netflix says uh okay make it here's the money uh see you when it's through and they don't they don't even put in their 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 uh two cents worth about how the show's coming out, you know, they don't sit there on the set and, and, and wrangle with you. And that's what everybody says they like about them. They let me make my movie. They let me do my TV show. And, uh, so they've, they've taken up for the failures of television, which is a lot of executives being a pain in the ass. Yeah. And it was, uh, the radio was run not much better. They, they were always, 
listening to consultants. That was a big thing I remember when we were around. Well, also, also every station had a program director. And I got to tell you, although I liked my program directors as people, okay, I didn't have much respect for most of them, you know, uh, because, uh, you know, I knew what I, what, what I needed to do. I could be successful. Leave me alone. I'll get you ratings. All right. But they weren't happy with that. They always had to meddle, you know, to feel that they were putting in their two cents worth. Yeah, make them feel worth something, I guess. But they always destroyed everything. And, and what they would do in radio stations, program directors would hold after-show meetings in which they would then have the show on tape and then they would play back little parts of it. And this was wrong and that was right and this was wrong and this was right. And you're going, God damn it. You know, finally, I had one program director, the guy at, at uh, Live 105, uh, uh, Richard Sands, who's a great guy, great guy, uh, one day finally said, you know, these meetings I'm holding with you are st uh, stupid. Oh, no, no, it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't Richard Sands. Oh, no, it was my program director, Dave Gorab at Sirius XM. He said after about, oh, a couple of months of these meetings, after every show, he said, you know, I don't think we have to have these meetings anymore. Who am I to tell Alex Bennett what to do? <laughs> and I went, now this guy I like. Um, yeah. And I like Richard Sands. He was terrific. But he did have a meeting every day, and we would sit there and argue like crazy, you know. But, uh, but, he, but he, was, he was a good guy, uh, but I still felt I was right and he was wrong. <laughs> if that makes any sense. Well, of course. Uh, well, it's your show. I hope if he's listening to this... Richard, you were wonderful to me. I appreciate it, you know. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, but it was Dave Gorab. Uh, and and I, I appreciated that when he said that to me because he realized that no matter what he told me in these meetings, the next day I'd go and do exactly the opposite, you know. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, oh, the, in radio stations, you know what gives you the most power? Good ratings, you know. With good yeah. ratings, you could go in and uh, t take down your pants and take a dump on the general manager's desk, and they go, "Oh, Alex, cut it out," <laughs> you know. But if your ratings are lousy, uh, they they they'd fire you, you know. So I mean, in 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 broadcast in television especially, ratings are everything. Uh, the problem with uh, with a lot of these things like Hulu and, uh, you know, the, I said nice things about Netflix, but they almost have to work that way because they don't really, I think, have ratings. Uh, and so they have to go on gut level, you know, and they also know they don't need ratings. They know how many people are watching any show at any given time because it's on the Internet. And they just look the meter and see how many people are watching and using bandwidth. Uh, so they don't have to even have ratings. It's pretty much put the ratings people out of business where those streaming services are concerned. Yeah, I think uh, they found in their comedy specials, uh, even big comics, a lot of people seem to tune out after about 15 minutes. Well, I, you know, I got let go at Sirius XM, but after nine years, nine and a half years, and I think part of the reason I lasted that long was because there were no ratings. There was no way they could figure out how many people were listening to a show on Sirius XM. Unlike streaming, they were shooting these shows down by satellite. And there was no two-way on those satellites, so they couldn't tell how many people were picking up the satellite at any given time. And so we never had any ratings. And so they had to go by gut level. You know, which it, it's good and it's bad because I was always very good at getting ratings, and and I I could use that as my survival mode. You know, hey, I'm getting you good numbers, but uh, no, we didn't have ratings. We were running, we were shooting. I didn't know if I had three people listening or three million. <laughs> I did. You, that's a long run you had there. I forgot it was that long. It was. It was a long. I think. Was it? I think it was the longest run I ever had in any outfit that I ever worked for. 
Maybe live, maybe live 105 was longer if you don't count the time I was not there for about, what, nine months or something? Yeah. Yeah. How do you feel about the day? See, I got fired, folks, from Live 105. Well, I, I, was it fired? I'm trying to remember now. Uh, I w yeah, I was fired from Live 105. And uh, uh, I went down to Florida. That's where I got to hate Florida so much. And then I came back, and uh, there was a new general manager, Pat McNally, and he said, uh, gee, let's, why don't we put the, the team back together again? Because the ratings were just terrible, okay, yeah, for yeah. the morning show. Uh, they thought they had a good idea of getting this guy Perry Stone from, from uh, San Jose, and, oh, he's going to get us ratings, and he didn't. He was just terrible. Anyway, I come back. And I, I had been fired, but now I'm coming back. People like Larry Brown had to suddenly hear that I was coming back. How did you feel? How did you get that news, and how did you feel about it? Uh, I just remember we were so happy. You called, you called me or Feldman, and you actually came out and met us at the Walnut Creek Punchline on a Sunday night, uh -huh. like a week a week before you're going back on air. This would have been. Uh, July of 91. Yeah. And I was just, yeah, we were just so happy to have you back. I remember it was really great. Yeah. But, and, and I, but I told you there that I was coming back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. See, you remember these things. I don't. In fact, yeah, you, I, I'm going to call you up every time I need a time or date <laughs> for something I did. If I'm writing like an autobiography or something, because you met, you met us at the Walnut Creek Punchline, then we went over to Denny's, and I think that's when you told us that you're coming back on the air. And then, uh, right, I think maybe the first or second week you're on, you actually did a show at the Masonic. Yes, it was a return show, and we did a return show. Yeah, yeah, we did a, a live show, and but. I, you know, I mean, it's funny with me getting older, and I'm about ready, or if, while after this episode has been played, I will have reached 82 years old. I have a hard time remembering years. In other words, like, when did I first go to San Francisco? Well, I think that was 69, okay? And I spent most of the 70s in San Francisco. Or, women, most of the 70s in New York. And then the 80s I spent in San Francisco. Right. Uh, but you see, right there I made the mistake. It, the, the, the continuity in my life kind of has gone wonky on me. Well, you can see why they have a statute of limitations because of people's memories in court. You just couldn't have, couldn't uh, be very hard to convict somebody of people's faded memories of something that happened 20 or 30 years ago. Yeah, well, I mean, yes, absolutely. You know, and and when I talk to you, you remember the exact dates. I mean, I can remember a lot of the dates. Yeah, I can remember. Uh, let's see. Well, when did, did when did I first go on the air at Live One Hundred and Five? I had gone from uh, the from Camel to the Quake, and then Live One Hundred and Five. What year? What day? Do you remember the date? Well, I first? Live One Hundred and Five, I believe, was February of eighty six. Febru February of eighty six. You see, okay. and I always thought it was earlier than that. Right. Well, you'd had uh, you'd been on the you'd been on the quake before yeah. that, and I started there. When you know, I did your the first show I did with you was in '83, but I think you were on the quake at least in '82, and before that, before I knew you, before I did stand up, apparently you were on uh, Camel K M E L, right, right. Okay, so you know, then Quake had, you were on Quake, and then they had. They were running out of money or something, and you were off the air for a while before you came back to Live 105. Right, right. Well, there was a there was a something like a six month period or something. Yeah, like it was a long time, and it was about. And I think Live 105 was the first one of the first uh, modern music, rock music's in the country. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, pro uh, progressive, I think we call it. Yeah. So you were February of '86, and then. I remember they let you go in July of 89. We're remembering my career by the times I've been fired. Yeah. <laughs> and then in July of 89, then you're off the air for a while. Then you had the earthquake. <laughs> I'll tell you, uh, while we're running out of time, but uh, maybe I can do it quickly. I was, they had to pay me while they were, while I was off because I had a contract. They had to keep paying me. 
And uh, all of a sudden, uh, Live 105 came along and decided, let's make like a, 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 a sports offer. And uh, they get, they have to pay, we'll only pay half his salary. He, they still have to pay the other half. And then if he gets the same ratings that he got at uh, the Quake, we will then take over the entire amount. And the guys at uh, at the Quake said, no, we we want you to take, uh, we, want, we want to do the 50% and leave it at that, okay? And uh, the first ratings that came out, <laughs> I equaled my ratings over at uh, over at the uh, uh, live uh, uh, over at the Quake. Wow! And so they had to keep paying half my salary for like a, about a year and a half, something like that. Anyway, that was a bad decision on their part, but the good decision on my part was talking to Larry Bubbles Brown today <laughs> because he reminds me of all the things that I did and when I did them. Thanks, Larry. See you next Thanks, time, Alex. Bye. <laughs> This is GabNet, the Great American Broadcast Network, now in its seventh year. Talk like you've never heard it before. Yes, 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 Larry Bubbles Brown. Uh, good to have him on in the new year. Huh? Huh? Yeah, and he'll be with us again uh, next week as well. Anyway, uh, welcome to our fine program. Uh, this is, uh, I'm, I seem to be, yeah, I always worry about being in sync. Uh, I don't know why I, you know, I have so many things that I have to do here when I'm doing the show. I mean, I switch things back and forth. Like if I push a button here, see, all of a sudden that comes up and then that comes up and then, oh, I don't know, then uh, my camera comes up and here I am. And I have to do all those things. And on top of that, I have to make sure it's going out okay and that it's recording okay and that everything is happening that's supposed to be happening and uh, I'm too old for this crap. It's what it's really about. But anyway, anyway, I have glasses on lately because ever since I got my eyes fixed, my eyesight has gone bad. Is that ridiculous? But I, I can't, uh, I, I, I can't read that well. So I put these on and I'm, I'm good to go. You know, uh, you know, it's like, it's like Betty Davis said, getting old ain't for sissies, and that's damn sure. Anyway, let's see here. We got to go to our, uh, our 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 panel, uh, but as usual, there's nobody there waiting except for a couple of people who I happen to like a lot, and I will admit them now. And uh, we will uh, hope that other people join them shortly. But uh, I don't uh, I don't give much hope here. That there'll be more than these people. Charlie Wallace, hello, Charlie, hey. and uh, Josh Wheeler, hello, Josh. Hello. Oh, how you doing? Doing good. How are you doing? Yeah. How'd you get through the new year? What, was your new year okay? Yeah, it was pretty good. Yeah. What'd you do? Anything special? No, I didn't. I didn't do anything. I was. Uh, I was pretty sick for a long time. So. What do you mean you were sick? Yeah, I was sick. What do you think you had? Don't know. COVID, maybe. Ooh, probably, but I don't know. I didn't take a <laughs> test, so I don't know. <laughs> How about your no, wife? I was working. I was always sick during the holiday. Yeah. I would be well the whole rest of the year, but every Christmas, every Thanksgiving, I would always be sick. It's your body going, whew. Yeah. yeah you know. Um, but uh, did your wife get sick? Yeah, before I was. Um, <laughs> like a day or two before Christmas, she was. And then Christmas Eve, we usually go stay at a hotel somewhere, and uh, she was. But not not really bad, you know, just like a inconvenient cold, and then maybe the next day a little worse, and then and then really was fine. But um, I, I became much more sick than she was. Well, let's ask the expert here. How about you, Brian? Uh, does it sound like he had COVID? <clears throat> there goes Brian. Where are you? Oh. <laughs> I, I'm going through a tunnel. I'm losing a signal. Uh, oh, okay. All right. Fine. Oh, you make the damn machines that test for this stuff, right? Yeah, but who knows anything anymore? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, he, you could have had it, which is actually good because you survived. If you, you did get it, you survived it okay, and you probably have more antibodies besides the ones you got with the shots. So, you know. Never know. Yeah, um, yeah I still 
I'm still a little each day a little better, but you know, I still have uh you know, maybe like once every ninety minutes I've got a cough. Yeah, there know, was, for there was, there was a couple a, minutes yeah. and get it all cleared out that I might be okay for an hour and then I got to do it again or whatever. There's, there was yeah. a there was a period of time just before COVID hit big time that I was sick for about two weeks, I think something like that. And I don't know mm. that maybe I didn't have it back then, you know, yeah. I mean, uh, whatever, but I'm, you know, so far I managed to dodge the bullet, you know, so. Yeah, I was, I mean, I was never like, you know, life threatening worry or anything, but, uh, I definitely had a couple of days where I coughed a lot. Um, yeah, my, I mean, um, actually it got to be where my ribs bothered me more than anything because they hurt really bad. You know? I, uh, so. uh, uh, Charlie, would you bet he had COVID? You know, he, he probably could have had a mild case of it. Yeah. yeah. You see the kid, the kids right now, they're, they're having a really bad cough. It's like, and, uh, yeah. So maybe Josh's uh, young body. <laughs> yeah. well, I don't know. I mean, you know, it's okay. You know, it's uh, pretty much done now, I guess. Uh, yeah. Like I said, I still, you know, feel some stuff, but nothing, nothing major. Well, you're still alive. That's good. You know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it was okay. I mean, I was pretty much off work anyway. Uh, basically, uh, there was a day or two I was going to be in, and then uh, a fair amount of my job I is on the computer anyway, and I can do it from home, so... I just kept up with a lot of my stuff from the house and instead of going in and stuff like that. So I stopped in one morning and walked around and checked on a couple things and uh, didn't really interact with anybody and then left. So, so how are you feeling now? Yeah, just, I'm fine. You know, like I said, I might have to call for something here and there, you know, like maybe well, during please. the show I'll have to mute button and, you know, well, clear there, everything out or something, but other than that, I'm okay. It, it just, everybody put on your masks. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, stay six feet away from them. Or is it 12 feet now? Uh, is, is the new normal 12 feet? Oh, look who's coming on a, on a, on a Friday. Oh, boy. Oh, no. Huh? Oh, I thought it's not allowed. Huh? That no, it's, it's allowed. allowed. He can call anytime he wants to. I just, you know, tried to make it easier for him. That's all. I don't know why. I, I see a full moon and fireworks. <laughs> oh, the full moon. <laughs> Beautiful picture, Phil. Hey, thanks. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What what to what do we owe this uh this uh this uh whatever it is. I had a COVID story. Oh, uh, re oh really? Yeah. <clears throat> so yesterday my installer oh, turn your mic would you do me a favor turn your mic down a little bit okay because oh, it, it would overpower everybody else and i yeah uh, is that we, lower there we go that's good yeah so yesterday my installer is starting a new job these people have been waiting a month uh for us to have a moment to be able to install mm -hmm. and he gets there and the lady's wearing a mask and she says i you know i, I i'm i'm got a little bit of a sniffle all right so he tears out all the flooring that's there and it's down to the subfloor and the uh, customer's daughter comes in and says well i've got a covid test that i got from my friend why don't you uh, see if that's what's going on <laughs> she tested positive for covid so my installer calls me and says phil what should i do i said pack your tools and get out of there and I said, you know, take the next five days, uh, stay at home, and I'll pay you, you know. But you got to quarantine, and then, you know, Monday get a get a COVID test, and you know, let me, you know, let me know what's going on. So the, the lady is, is she's crying, you know. I said, well, you know, what do you want me to do? I, I said, I, I, you know, I can't have him work around you and then go into other people's homes. I, you know, can't do it. Uh, you know, so the husband says, oh, geez, thank you for putting us back in the rotation at the end of the month. Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, you know, I, yeah. I think everybody will be fine. Meanwhile, I hope you all like your bare floors. <laughs> oh, yeah, she's she says, um, you know, I'm sick and now I have to walk around on subfloor. I said, it's not nothing I can do. You shouldn't be walking around anyways. Well, Stay you, in bed. You, were yeah. you were doing what was, I think, the best possible practice, you know? Yeah. 
I mean, it, she's the one that gave herself the test while he was there for crying out loud. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, what, what are you going to do? Well, we got these 15 minute tests here. Yeah. You know, uh, we sent away for them, but we're not using them because we don't have any, you know, suspicion that we have anything. Hey, when I was really active, I was a 15 minute guy myself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the woman didn't get the results in 15 minutes. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> she no, got him. She got, actually, got she me. actually, she, actually, she got him in about thirty seconds, from what right. I hear about no, that's you. All she got was fifteen minutes, <laughs> and that was with floor play. <laughs> floor play? Yeah, floor play. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> God. Oh, Friday night Phil is funny. Phil's on a roll. Yeah, <laughs> Phil. Well, Phil's a very funny guy when he wants to be. You know, uh, so. It's good, good to see you here. Oh, here, oh, look, here comes Vernon Null, another, wow. another regular. Uh, Kevin just joined us. Uh, what the hell's Phil doing here? Huh? Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> what, what the hell's not, Phil I, doing? I, forest. I got dementia. Yeah, <laughs> he heard us talking about him last night. Hi, Phil. Night. How are you? We, we, he heard us talking about him last night, and he's a lot like Beetlejuice. You say his name three times, and he shows up. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Anyway, so uh, uh, well, so, well, sorry to hear you weren't feeling well, uh, uh, Josh, uh, but uh, it's good to know you're not in, you're on the mend, okay, whatever that means. In other words, you're still above room temperature, and I think that's good. Anyway. I'm okay. Down in Kentucky, ladies and gentlemen, it's the lovely strains of Vernon Nunn and his orchestra. Hello, Vernon. How you doing? Yeah, how you doing down there? Well, we had uh, one of our volunteers at Habitat test positive for COVID yesterday. Oh, wow. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so you want to tell us something new that's unusual that hasn't happened to you? <laughs> well, the, the, the ice and snow, since, since the tornado that ripped across western Kentucky, we've had two additional emergencies declared by the governor because of the ice and snow that's wow. gone through here. Wow. Wow. In, didn't I see in California where they, they had a lot of the fires and stuff, now they have a lot of snow? Did it read that somewhere? No, I didn't. I, I, saw, I saw that in Colorado. Colorado, yeah. In Colorado. Colorado, okay. yeah. Right. That's where it was. Yeah. yeah. Uh, boy, you know, what, 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 what's all that noise? Uh, uh, I bet that's uh, Kevin. Golf playing papers. Oh. Kevin, Sorry. Kevin. Yeah. Uh, yeah um, uh, when when are when are the frogs and boils coming? Is what I'm wondering. After the locusts. And the no, locusts. That, those, we already had the locusts. Uh, the mur remember the murder hornets. The murder hornets were supposed oh, yeah. to be here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but what the hell? You know, it's it's uh, we're 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 in bad we're in bad shape, all the way around. I hate to say that. You know. well, the good the good news about the uh, positive test on uh, my volunteer is that we were following the protocol for habitat and we were all wearing masks indoors. Oh, okay. okay. All right. And so and so the chances that this, this person who tested positive had helped his neighbor out on Monday night and he was real real close to with him helping whatever they were doing on Monday night. And then he came to Habitat on Tuesday. Has, hasn't had any symptoms until today. And that's when he tested positive. But he thinks he caught it from the neighbor because the neighbor informed him on Wednesday that he had tested positive. God, this, so, thing, this thing is ridiculous, isn't it? Well, the good thing is we've, we've changed the protocol at Habitat. Number one, all volunteers are required to wear masks indoors right if you're working indoors you have to wear a mask and i think that probably has kept any of the other people who were working there were six of them on last tuesday it's probably kept any of the other people who worked that day around this guy from catching it in a lot of cases the whole time. in a lot of cases in construction which habitat for the humanities is don't you wear masks if you're doing something that's dusty, like drywall, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're, you're going you're gonna to wear a dust mask anyway. Yeah, so, you know, 
that's a lot of the work, oddly enough. You know, so people are used to working in in, in building homes and wearing masks at times. So. Yeah, well, if you're cutting if you're cutting trim or things like that, and you've got the saw set up outdoors, usually, yeah, so you're not probably wearing you're probably wearing eye protection, but you're yeah. probably not wearing a dust mask if you're sawing yeah. trim outdoors. I, I assume by trim you mean stuff that goes along the walls and stuff like that, right. not what I refer to as trim, which is. Yeah. <laughs> Something else. Oh, no, what do you what do you refer to as trim? Oh, yeah, uh, well, <laughs> you got legs that go up to here. Uh, let me close uh, my door, please. <laughs> close uh, your door. Yeah, the show is getting wrong. Oh, nice oh, pants. Man. Nice pants. Oh, yeah, well, hey. All right. I just yeah, put man. on I just put on a new pair to just now tonight. I, uh, my Christmas attire. So warm. And I had forgotten this. This is a fleece uh, uh, overshirt. And um, uh, it's great to sit around the house, especially here where they don't turn on the heat very often, and it keeps it really nice and toasty and warm and good, you know. So. From Costco? No, no. Marjorie got this from I don't know. It was a hundred dollar thing here. This this deal. REI for that kind of stuff. What? what? REI. Do they have one of those out by you? What's REI? REI. No. Yeah. Oh, it's uh, like an outdoor uh... recreational equipment. Something I don't know what it is. I can't. I can't remember where. Well, my girlfriend had always went camping. Got a lot of stuff there. Oh, yeah. wait a minute. Who 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 made this? I can, if I can, if I can. Do... Anybody read the label there? Uh, <laughs> there's the label. Oh, wait a that's minute. That'd be a hide. What? Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, wait, 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 that's made in China. Uh, Made in China. Made, not where? Made in China. Yeah. No, I, oh, there we go. There's the label. Did can anybody read it? Uh, all we can see. Oh. You know, it'd just be better if I took the damn thing off, right? Looked at it. Hold on a second. We can read your cap. Well, of course. Probably L.L. Bean. I, mean, I think it is, actually. No? It's Bean Signature. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's L.L. Bean. L.L. Bean, yeah. yeah. L.L. Bean. They sell those at Costco for $17 a piece. No, they don't. L.L. Bean. Bean stuff isn't cheap. dollars a piece. That used to be catalog only. Uh, I, I think it still is. Oh, really? Yeah. Now it's owned by the pillow guy. Yeah, it's owned by the Mike Pillow guy. With all that money he made. Yeah. yeah. Does he have any money left? Uh, in, if he was an attorney, he would. Yeah. <laughs> instead, he ended up. Instead, he ended up being a Trump supporter. He, uh, I think, he'll be out of business shortly. I mean, he's he's in bad shape. And have you no, gone? Bill's, if you ever, have you gone coffee. to his site lately? He's selling everything but the kitchen sink. And I think next week he's selling kitchen sinks. Alan, how many uh, how many my pillows do you own? Um, I have four brand new ones that are still sealed, and then I have three other ones that I use on a regular basis. Most comfortable pillow I've ever owned. Never go out of business. Not with guys like Alan. <laughs> yeah, but know? now on the other hand, Phil, you said yeah, you bought some. the last time I bought them was in January. You said you bought some, and you hate them. Yeah, I bought two, and I and very uncomfortable. I wouldn't. Uh, I don't like. I, I wouldn't take his word for it. He's a Republican. well. I did, I never bought any, and I still hate them. Okay, <laughs> so you know. Yeah, I should hey, Alan, send you these, Kevin. If they're unsealed, what are you saving them for? You're going to sell them on eBay as collector's items or something? I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I, because I because I, I thought that they would wear out more quickly. I've had the first two since 2018, the first three. And they, they don't wear out. You, you put them in a washer with really hot water and put them in the dryer for two hours and they dry. Yeah. They don't crush down either. They're like a big pillow and they and well you know phil phil had to get the extra firm ones and now he's complaining about his neck hurting yeah well, mm-hmm. well yeah, I did. that's about all i got some of the stuffing out that's all you got nowadays it's extra firm right oh stop it <laughs> just stop it <laughs> you don't go after somebody who has a problem with that kind of joke you I know said it, I, I said it for a problem does he have <laughs> Extra firm. Keeping yeah. extra firm. Well, wow. I guess this show isn't going to be monetized. Anyway, <laughs> you know, you know what happens? I'll tell you. 
they only do it on the live show. After the show's over, I go over and I look at the live feed before I post the recorded feed. And uh, I go over there and they say, um, you, you can't be monetized. You know, this may not be acceptable to advertise it. So then I have to put in there, I request a, a, uh, uh, a redo of your assessment, okay? Because it was done by a machine anyway. And then they always get back to me and say, congratulations, guess what? You know, and I go, I'm going, and, and over the last year, I went back and looked at every show. And uh, there are no, because I always requested a review. There were none of them have ever been demonetized after they did the review. Alex, so did haven't you? they learned by now? Hey, Alex Bennett does this show. We keep getting this machine review, uh, and then we're forced to go do it. We should probably just, you know. They send that to every YouTuber on the planet. And if if they don't say anything, then they don't get paid, and YouTube keeps the money. So it's just an no, automatic. They, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. If I'm not monetized, they don't get money. Somebody gets the money. No. It's not like all of a sudden you're demonetized, so now YouTube can get all the money from the ad in the front. The way it works. YouTube gets the money. You get bupkis. Well, I'm, I think this year, this year, folks, uh, if any of you want part of it, I'll be happy to send you a small stipend. I made $200 this year. You should divide that up amongst us. You know, uh, actually, idea, um, uh, Joe Rogan makes that in three seconds. Okay, so, you know, I, I just don't understand it. I just don't understand it. Uh, so I keep getting, they keep demonetizing me. And then, so I then write them. And then after about seven days, they write back and say, oh, well, no, that we found out you can be monetized. It's fine. Your review is passed and blah, blah, blah. And I'm going, you know, people were only looking at that show for a couple of days. <laughs> And now I'm not getting into the advertising revenue because you guys demonetized it, you know? Maybe so. they should advertise my pillow on it. Yeah. So. No, they wouldn't let him on because uh, uh, he doesn't uh, spew their uh, their way of doing it. No, he, he spews is what the problem is, Phil. You know, yeah. They're, they're not trying to censor people. They're just trying to keep people from passing across what they consider to be false information the interesting thing is trump doesn't have anything good to say about the pillow guy uh now something happened i don't know what happened between they had a falling out oh you know i know what happened somebody was getting sued trump lost trump wanted to separate himself from the guy i guess uh, uh that may have been what was going on uh, uh the guy was saying things that was going to uh, hurt trump and trump got Got out of there. Well, and yeah, how- but, but Trump befriended him, and I got I got to say this about the My Pillow guy. In spite of the fact I think he's a total douchebag, and uh, uh, really is is he's uh, he's a horrible person. Okay, anyway, but that, that, really that not people. being the case, forget about it for a moment. I think that you honor your friends by sticking by them. And this is a guy who was invited to the White House, who sat with Trump, who stood up for Trump, and is in fact literally losing his business over his f- feeling of friendship with Trump, okay? And so Trump then abandons him. What kind of a guy is Trump? The guy uh, went on and and started saying, you know, uh, as Alan would say, some Marjorie Taylor Greene type stuff uh, uh, about Trump, the election, and things like that. And I think it was hurting Trump and... Okay implicated him uh, negatively in a, in a lawsuit. I, I think it's because the Trump... The problem is it's all true. It's because t- Trump will dump people at a moment's notice if he yep. feels it doesn't benefit him. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Well, that's Trump. That's Trump. Well, I mean, how can you admire somebody like that? I don't admire him. I just like his positions on uh, and, and policies. But, uh, you know, as far as as a person... Uh, you know, I didn't elect him to be a nice guy. Uh, you know, I voted for him to do what he said he was going to do, which was what he did. And what was what that? I, uh, destroy the, build the republic? Wall and restrict Muslims coming into the country. Build the yeah. wall and, and control the border. Which he did not. And make Mexico pay for it. Make Mexico pay for it. Well, yeah. Which neither happened. I, uh, he needed 
another four years to get the check. Yeah, right. I it's still, I still four love four the, years. I still four love four the years. quote from the uh, former uh, uh, prime minister or president of Mexico. I can't remember what his name was now. Oh, uh, yeah, I am not paying for that fucking, fucking wall. wall. Yes, <laughs> not pay- we're not paying for that fucking wall. Yeah. Um, That's funny. Dobrador or something like I that. I can't remember what his name was, but he was. The check is in the mail. The check, Never the, it, yeah. Yeah, the check is in the mail. I'm gonna I'm gonna post date it five years later, 10, twenty years down yeah, the road. Yeah, Don't yeah. care. Yeah. Twenty years. Yeah, but I mean, it's just amazing that uh, you know. I I just think he should have stood by the, my pillow guy a little better than he did. You know. He doesn't well, stand he offered him a caddy job at his uh, Mar-a-Lago golf club. A caddy job? Yeah. <laughs> and pretty soon he might have to take it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, your slogan probably should be, we leave you with a bare floor. Yeah. I stole, I stole uh, a saying from a store that my father used to do business with in New York. Uh, we buy by the mile, you save on every yard. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. Charlie Wallace has his hand up, and he's looking at his phone, so there must have been some headlines. No, no, Michael Jackson and Lisa Marie Presley were married for 18 months. 18 oh. months? Oh, okay. Wow. Well, was that from beginning to end? Or was Just that... May 1994 to December 1995. Is that when she moved out of the house? I mean, you know. Hey, I haven't opened up the story. That's just... Yeah, yeah. But... The, the Nicholas Cage, right? Nicholas Cage, they got married? Well, she married Nicholas Cage. Nicholas Cage and Michael Jackson? First. No. Yeah, um, before Michael Jackson, I think. She was married to Before? Nicolas Cage, yeah, Nick Cage. And he was a huge Elvis fan, right? So he yes. just married her just to... Whack Elvis's daughter. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, anyway, so... Whack that you, booty. You, you go down to... to uh, you go down to uh, Graceland, and they have her plane there, the plane, the Lisa Marie, the big oh. plane that, uh, that uh, Elvis owned. Huh. Uh, until oh, he was, was too fat to get Lisa through Marie. the door. Lisa he was Marie. that heavy at Lisa Marie was his granddaughter. Remember that? Lisa was his wife. His daughter. L Lisa Marie, no, Lisa Marie, was, Lisa Marie was married to Michael Jackson. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I'm getting confused. And then she was also married was to Nicholas Cage. Right. And uh, now she's married to the My Pillow guy. I don't know if you if you knew that. <laughs> 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 that was really good. Yeah. Start that rumor. She yeah. is such. <laughs> What are you doing? She is such a celebrity chaser. I, I, you know, I have no idea about that. I heard, I heard Lindsey Graham was trying to date her. I don't know. <laughs> oh boy. Well, anyway. Isn't he from your home state, there, uh, Vernon? How, by the way, I want to ask. Uh, I want to ask Josh. How do you celebrate uh, Insurrection Day? <laughs> I went to work. Really? The same thing I did the day that it happened. I wanted to do everything exactly the same. Exactly the same, yeah. Exactly the same. Yeah, so did MSNBC. So you're not alone. Yeah. Uh, I I was so sick of, by the end of uh, July, uh, July, January 6th, I was so sick of this re just absolutely repeating what happened a year ago over and over and over and over and over and over again, you know. Do one little five-minute piece on it. Say this happened a year ago. Isn't it terrible? And it still lingers today. And move on to the new other news, which is important. And we never get to any of it. You know, we do, they just dwell on the same thing over and over again. And then they go. Today they were jumping up and down with glee the minute Sidney Poitier died, because oh, no. they could then spend hours and hours and hours on Sidney Poitier. You know. So, I mean, they just they, they just sit there waiting on their haunches, waiting for something to happen. Oh, yeah, and then today, of course, they got the Armored Barbary. Bar, bar, Armored. Bar, bar, I'm trying to remember. The Ahmed. 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 Bar. How do you pronounce it? Arby. Arbery. 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 Um, uh, case. Ahmad Arbery. Um, yeah, Ahmad Arbery case. Uh, they did the sentencing. And uh, two of them got life without possibility of parole. Is that is there such such a thing as that? I mean, that's called cool, throwing away. Well, the where you make it so definite that there's no yeah. way that anybody yes. can ever get out. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And the and the third guy, I guess the guy who took the photographs and the pictures, the video. He shot the video. Shot yeah. the video. Uh, he got a life with possibility of parole. How old is he? I have He's, no idea. I have no idea. Uh, oh, uh, I, 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 Fifty. Oh, yeah. He'll never. He'll never see the outside of prison. He's in his fifty. Hey, I got this one here. Property records show that four times married celebrity Scientologist purchased uh -huh. three point one four acre two parcel compounded located behind the gates of the star studded Hidden Hills community in December of nineteen ninety three. What does this got to do with what we were talking about? Because he's trying to prove that he was near. Oh. He was near greatness. He wasn't oh. there, oh. but he mm -hmm. was near I, greatness. I was just behind the fence. Yeah. <laughs> you could yell and say, "Did you? Did your father? Her dad? Her dad was Elvis. I would ask, did he really eat the pancakes with banana? No, the banana and yeah, cheese. Are you yeah, sure you're only oh, yeah. drinking coffee? Are, are you talking about Elvis's predilection towards uh, banana? What is it? 
Egg cheese, like. No, I tried it once. I banana potato chip sandwich. No, a, 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 a banana no, and potato a, chip sandwich. Grilled cheese sandwich. He made a grilled cheese with banana. I tried it once. I cut it sliced. It thin. I didn't like it. Of course not. That would suck. And I tried it. I cut it thin and I put it. It just didn't taste good. I, took it. I just wanted to know what it tasted like. Did you try the banana cheese or did you use regular cheese? No, I used regular banana, actually. I cut it thin. And then I just put it in like... Boy, this show's like getting down to the nitty gritty of stuff tonight, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I just wonder what it tastes like. All, I the, gotta try. all, all the major yeah. topics. Y yes. I, I like banana and peanut butter sandwiches. Sir. Yeah, that I do like. You're on, on peanut butter and apple too sometimes. And pickles and apples. Yeah. What? Peanut butter yeah. and apple. Peanut butter and apple right there. Mm. Peanut what? butter and that apple. That I like, yeah. That's pickles, good. Uh, what are you, pregnant? Well, <laughs> well, well, well peanut butter, butter and apple would work. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, yeah, peanut butter and apple would work. So does almond butter and hazelnut butter and apple and celery, you know? Very fat. Nutella is very fat. Oh, not Nutella. Nutella. Uh, they've got like hazel, it's just regular hazelnut uh, butter. That instead of peanut butter, they make it from hazelnuts. Well, you know what's happening to me lately? And no, I, th uh, I think I'm dying of something. Uh, well, of course. Do. I'm dying well, we of something. Yeah, we all are. <laughs> yeah, we all are. Uh, but uh, Marjorie is doing everything she can to see if she can fatten me up. I mean, like I'm lying there. We're watching, um, uh, what? Not that again. What's not that again? I'm dying. You're, I'm dying. Oh, I'm going to be dying next. So. Marjorie, you got an insurance yeah. policy in your life? Anyway, let, probably feeding let, like let, 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 me, let, me <laughs> let me tell you this, what I was going to tell you, okay? <laughs> so anyway, we're sitting there watching endless binge shows i won't even begin to tell you what we we so miss, miss yellowstone we started watching yellow jackets you know uh so anyway we, we, and what she does is we're lying there which is no exercise at all okay there is no sweat being used lying in bed okay but we would think it probably should be an olympic sport because we'd be very good at it what if you put another blanket on you? Maybe you could sweat then. We put a blanket on. We weren't sweating either. Anyway, uh, so so she then says, oh, well, let me go out to the kitchen. I'll be right back. She comes back with a bag of potato chips. I knew it. I knew it. That's and then mind. she leaves the room, and she comes back with a bag of corn chips. Frito Lays? And I'm going, what are you trying to do to me here? You know? And then she says, do you want some of those sea salt crackers? Yeah, I'll take a couple. And she brings like five. I'm not eating anything. Yeah. Oh. And then every day, just to make oh. sure I'm not gaining any weight from this, I have my jeans, which I never get into because I never go out. Okay, because it's like snowing last night, whatever. And I put on these pants and I'm able to fit right into them and they're getting less than snug. And I'm going, I'm losing weight? Were those the ones you used to wear before you started Atkins? Uh, uh, no, these are the ones I bought halfway between. Oh, you know, you, you once showed a picture or something of the pants that you had prior when you had lost down to like 170-something. Yeah. Uh, and then you had your, your, your total fat pants. Yeah. I think yeah. I looked too thin then. Did you, did you keep those pants or did you toss them? Uh, I toss those because you don't want to ever get back to those, you know, but uh, um, uh, I just, uh, you know, I just, uh, um, I, I just wondering why I'm not gaining weight with all this crap she's feeding me. You the know? scale is broken. You're dying. Yeah. Well, eventually I'll put it on the B2 Maybe you have a tape one. Uh, you know, I, I, when I buy jeans, I get the stretch ones, so I, I can never tell. <laughs> Okay, well, I do have a pair that are slightly stretchy, but I don't know where they're stretchy too. I hear. How, how would you know that, Alan? I, I said I hear. That's what I said. I said I hear. You sniff at the drawer. <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah, just before he paused at the door to get out. Anyway, uh, I gotta find the trim somewhere. So look, you know, uh, I mean, uh, Josh. Um, is a is a political wonk, and today in the Supreme Court they heard the arguments against the mandates for 
vaccinations the president had for companies over a hundred. All right, how do you think? Uh, how do you think that's going to go? They say that it looked like the the justices weren't too happy with the law. I kind of lean that way. I don't know what they said <clears throat> on C-SPAN right now, and it's on my television, but you know, I don't have the volume up, of course, so I haven't listened to it yet. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I would have to think, you know, it's probably going to have a tough road, but, you know. But doesn't, but doesn't, the, pre- doesn't the president have the right to pass laws for the health and welfare of the country? <laughs> Well, he, he has the right as, you know, the executive under which, you know, OSHA and its parent department falls under health and human services, et cetera, that, you know, through executive orders to enforce certain rules and regulations. And then they have some sort of blank check powers within that because OSHA cannot make a law for every single um you know, every single contingency that could ever happen. So they, they have some, you know, broad verbiage that allows them to do certain things. I mean, I have a decent amount of experience with that, you know, in, in the real world. But I don't know that having people be forced to undergo a medical, you know, procedure, if you will, as minor as we may, you know, see it, is something that is going to be perceived as being okay when some of those laws were written. Mm -hmm. I'm not telling you that I think it's good or bad or it will work or it won't work. I'm just saying, you know, I think that's, that's the question is what I'm saying, you know, is, um, you know, this, this language was, you know, it's a, I guess there's a lot of difference between, you know, OSHA having the power to, as new technology develops, say, you know, you have to, this new piece of equipment that's come out, you have to put a guard over that here, here, and here is far different from saying, and you have to take everyone who operates it to the doctor and get them inoculated for something. I mean, that's just two different types of things. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be the question. I don't know that it's overreach. I don't see it as overreach. I see it as uh, as something that's Mm -hmm. looking out for my health. Yes, uh, yeah, I mean, Vernon. It's, 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 you know, in that well, area, well, you know, it's, I don't know that it's overreach. Um, I think I might personally sort of lean that way, but, you know, legally, I mean, that's, yeah. it's certainly an area that's going to split a lot of people. Vernon you know? has I mean, his hand up. Definitely. The, the thing is, the thing that I find uh, really annoying is that the people who are against, the mandate are are singling it out and saying, "Okay, you can't force me to to get vaccinated." But that's not what the president has edicted. What the president has said is, you have to require your employees if you have a hundred or more employees in your company, you have to require them to get vaccinated. Or, mm-hmm. and this is the part that Republicans like to leave out. Yeah. Or. They have to submit to a testing regimen and wear masks all the time while they're at work. So you got a choice there. You can either get vaccinated or you can do the the testing regimen. And that is to protect the public. It's to protect public health. Right. Not some kind of it's not some kind of dramatic Jacksonian uh, uh, requirement to control your life. It's to protect public health. Let me ask you something. Let's say the person wants to get the test right now. And for the last month, I don't think anybody's been able to get many of those tests. Uh, and the people that need those tests are the ones that are most at risk, you know, older people, people in nursing homes. And uh, so if people are, are just taking these tests, uh, they're, they're going to be scarce, but we can't get tests. Uh, you know, I have an employee that was exposed to COVID uh, yesterday, uh, I don't know where he's going to get a test. You know, a lot of the tests are being sucked up right now because the schools. Yeah. Right well, yes, uh, Tony. You know, I was thinking to like Vern was saying with the mandates, and think even though this is not about the mandates, but thinking about it like say twenty, say thirty, forty years ago when I was a kid, right? Say in the early eighties, 
You were allowed to smoke when my mother took me to McDonald's. They were smoking everywhere. Now we understood that cigarettes, secondhand smoke can get you sick. Now you can't smoke at certain places. How come they're not going crazy about that? The Republicans like it's for our and, own health. And how about the, how about the fact that Republicans aren't going crazy over the fact that in most school districts in the United States, as a parent, you are required to have your kid inoculate against the flus, the measles, the mumps, whatever, all, all these various shots. And nobody's complained about that. But on a local level, uh, this is the uh, national uh, at national level saying that you have to have a vaccine. Now, all the all the kids, every no, they're not. They need to have a vaccine. It's a choice, Bill. They're not saying you have to have a vaccine. See, that's that's where I get so frustrated with Republican thinking people. It's it, you're saying you have to have a vaccine. That's not what they're saying. They're Listen. saying you got a choice. You can yeah, either get vaccinated. Or you can have a testing regimen. You have a choice there. This is your choice. Get vaccinated or the government's going to make your life miserable and they're going to make sure you can't work and you can't uh, go to a restaurant. And, uh, you know, I think the government has the right to do that for, to protect public health. Uh, yes, Charlie. Typhoid Mary was locked up for her whole life, kept away from people because typhus didn't make her sick. But anybody that got around her got sick from it. So for 30 something years, she was locked away and couldn't go anywhere. Quarantine. Wow. Well, I didn't, like I said, I didn't listen to the argument yet. And, and I will. I'll probably maybe try to play it tomorrow. But I think one of the things that they'll look at, you know, because it falls under OSHA's guidelines, is typically what you'll get sometimes with an OSHA guideline is they'll try to take a look at, if the enforcement or the regulation will cause basically an undue burden to the employer. So they'll have to weigh the, the burden versus, you know, I guess the results that they could get. Now, I mean, I think there are some things obviously that no matter what the burden would be, if you want to be in business, this is what you have to do. So, you know, maybe that's the way it'll go. But at times, you know, they will look at how that goes. So, you know, some companies, large companies or whatever, you know, like mine, for example, I'm not saying this is what they do. I'm not speaking for them. I'm just saying someone that employs as many people could say, you know, if we don't make our folks get vaccinated and you're saying they have to have all these tests every couple of days or once a week or twice a week, whatever it is, you know, it's very burdensome. OK, it's a lot of, you know, I don't know, you know, testing, paperwork, uh, logistics, et cetera, et cetera. And that is a lot of you know, work, it's an undue burden, that kind of thing. I mean, it's, it's, you know, and it, 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 it costs too much. It's very costly or whatever. I mean, it's kind of the, how, you know, when the Americans with Disabilities Act passed, for example, yeah. you know, but you already owned a building that was built in 1950. They didn't make you then immediately convert that building. They, you know, it's, it's an undue burden. Okay. So it's grandfathered in. Now, if you build a new building, it has to meet it. Or if you remodel that building, you have to bring it up to that but you don't have to just because we passed it. So it, I'm just saying that's, I think that's something that'll get weighed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, the, the opposition to that, if that's their argument, will at least have a, a, a legitimate argument. You might, you might still not think, I don't care. I don't care if it costs a bazillion dollars or whatever. I think it's worth it. And that is also a legitimate point of view. But I, I think that will be, maybe one of the arguments that they use. Um, I'd be interested to listen to see if that's what they argued. Uh, yes, uh, Alan. Why, why can't the president take something out of Trump's playbook? Why can't he sign an executive order? He signed an executive well, that's, order. But he, that's what he did. That's what the law is for. That's what the law is for. I didn't know that you could challenge an executive order. Yes? Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. Wow. Yeah, you can challenge the enforcement of any federal law. Oh, okay. You know, that, that you want to. I don't like paying taxes. I'm going to challenge that. <laughs> That's been tried four or five times. Good luck. You won't be the first. <laughs> right. Oh, sure. Thanks, Vernon. I mean, I, but also, that's 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 another argument that the opposition is probably going to make, because they are probably going to say that the president, the executive, does have some of these powers within our language, within our verbiage that we use, but this is outside of those boundaries and a change this large we are not they may argue i don't know we're not saying that 
this would be unconstitutional. Uh, as written, we're saying it's unconstitutional as implemented. In other words, if Congress had passed this language and the president had signed it, that would be one thing. So they may argue that as well, that this was too far and that it bypassed the legislative process. You know, because typically only Congress can change OSHA's regulations or federal law. It's very cumbersome to do, um, but times change. So there is some power within OSHA's language to change the things that they enforce through the executive. Their director has some of their own powers to do it, et cetera. But again, we write these things and they're at times ambiguous. And if you ask some people, they're going to say, well, that's a very broad power. And if you ask some other people, they're going to say, no, no, that was very narrow. And you'd have to go to Congress. So that's probably going to be the argument, I think, that it was done outside of the boundaries of what OSHA had the power to do. And that it's probably an undue burden on the employers. And I don't know that they're going to approach it nearly as much from an individual freedom uh, point of view. I, I don't know, but that's my guess. You're right. Uh, uh, what, uh, you know, just hearing in the background what they were talking about, uh, it was that, that OSHA didn't have the power to, to do this. And that's right. uh, overstepped or. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't know that they're going to argue that the government doesn't have the power to tell a person you know, that they have to have some sort of uh, uh, medical, you know, thing done for public safety because you guys are correct, right? We do have other laws, you know, polio or, you know, this vaccine or whatever. So they're not as well prepared to make that argument because they're, they don't have much precedent on their side for that. So probably what they're going to argue is, yeah, we can see that point, but we are going to argue that those regulations, those laws and procedures came about through the normal and complete legislative process. You know, a bill was introduced in the House. It went through a committee. It went through debate. It was passed. The same thing happened in the Senate, went to the executive and it was passed. And all of the people were represented in that in that process by all their lawmakers and our national executive. And, uh, you know, I think that might be one of their arguments that those laws came about through that process and this law did. I, I can't I can't, remember, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't remember what one of the right wing judges said today, but I read what he was saying and I, I can't even quote it to you, but it just seems so stupid as a, as an idea and as a concept that I couldn't well, believe Alito, it was even, uh, huh? Alito, Alito was the judge who, who said what you're talking about and I had the same reaction. And what was that? What did he say exactly? I'm trying to remember what he said, but, you know, my memory isn't what it used it, to be. It was, it was something to the effect is that can, uh, how can you say that vaccinations are in the public interest? It's some <laughs> stupid thing like that. <laughs> yeah, where do you live? Well, I guess he does live in a cloistered, gated community, you know. Uh, I, I, yeah, I mean, you know, I don't know. I mean, unless they're just... I mean, sometimes they might ask a sort of open question like that to try to get the, you know, an answer on where the legal theory that the other side has, you know, for that or whatever. I mean, I'll listen to it, but let me ask Brian. I mean, I, let me, yeah, let me ask Brian a question while I got him here, uh, because your company puts out the pieces of equipment that test for COVID, right? Right. Yes. Uh, are you having trouble meeting the demand? Wedding. Oh yes, 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 yes. Really? So when I when I when I was a director of manufacturing uh, in the production group, we ha had about 20, 20 different assays, different diseases, infectious diseases that we were testing for. Yeah. One of our goals was you're never to be on back order. So we would come close because sometimes we had some tough times building the chemistry for it, but we we did very good. Now we're like back ordered on you know. All of the concentration is now on COVID and fluvid, our fluvid assays, and we still can't keep up. We have the Newark plant. We have two buildings we're just opening now, and they're they're starting to get up. They've done like five million tests so far, and then ours, uh, the the Lodi one, the big one that I've been working on, uh, that one's coming up uh, April fourth uh, for for production. And yeah, we cannot keep up with the demand at all. 
You just can't, and it's it's impossible even for you. And, you. and you're a fairly big company at this point, right? Yeah, we're yeah we're very big right now. And you also do you have a plant in China as well? So China and India, we have some small stuff that we're starting to get into right now. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're just starting up in qualifications, but yeah, yeah. What type of small and wait, when, when is we China? Also? Condoms. Let's see what else would be in China. There's small stuff. What? We also have a Sweden. Did, we, Sweden did I have... just hear? Did I just hear a racist remark? No. Said they got small peepees. An, no. an anti-Asian remark referring no. to no. Asians no. with small penises. That's what I heard. That's what you heard, well, how, right? How, how, I heard you, small peepees, Alex. <laughs> see, <laughs> it, Tony, you know Tony, a very nice and loyal guy, just ratted on you. Hey, Tony, yeah. where do you go yeah. on Sunday for dinner? Well, I, know, I used to go. Me and my mom used to get it delivered all the time. Friday nights was Friday night. Let's say where you go, Tony. Dude, Dude. Tony. Tony, Tony, Chinese food. I know. She used to say that. Let's go to Chinese food. Chinese food. Right. Alex, she has all the old menus. I said I had to throw them out. I'd save some of them. But just, just I won't get in trouble. They'll we come do. in 15 minutes. And I said, don't worry. We, <laughs> build about, we build over 300,000 tests a day, and we cannot keep up. Wow. How many tests a day? Three hundred thousand, wow. and you can't keep up. Wow, are, are these tests uh, uh, only COVID or all the things that you guys do? No, they're COVID and fluvid. I think we're doing some MRSA stuff right now, also. But yeah, like eighty percent. Now, what is fluvid? Fluvid is uh, for assays for flu respiratory diseases that we can check for. People that oh, have wow. flu and COVID, right? Yeah. Now we have plus. The plus assay because we're taking care of the uh, Delta variant. Okay. All right. So yeah, this so we're, is... we're yeah we're we're very busy. So in other words, <laughs> I mean, the, 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 everything we work. The supply chain system is so damaged right now. I, I, it doesn't matter what the fuck you're making. No one can make anything the way we're supposed to be making anything, and it's been very difficult to get people to work. I mean, I'm not saying that it's due to anything in particular. But look, I think everyone that I talk to deals with the same thing. There are people just don't want to come to work. Yeah. I mean, it, yes. Our absenteeism yeah. rate is incredibly yeah. high, and it's not for COVID. I mean, it, it's just because they're not showing up in Georgia. <laughs> they make most of the carpet in Georgia. There's one big carpet mill, Mohawk. It's very, yeah. very large, and uh, they have a lottery. So if you show up for work, you get a ticket for the lottery. Oh, really? Work overtime, you get two tickets, and the prize is the uh, Jeep Cherokee every month. Yeah. Wow. A new Jeep Cherokee, and all you got to do is show up for work, and and then, you know, you're they'll, if they draw your name uh, or, you know, it's, you win. Maybe and you want to do that with your employees, Phil. Uh, and you get a better chance of getting COVID. <laughs> what did you now, say? Wait a minute. Phil, it, let Phil finish because we well, uh -huh. continue what you're saying, Phil. We couldn't hear you. That's how bad it is and how difficult it is to get people up for work. Uh, you know, that the, they're resorting to giving away a car every month. Wow. You ought to do that, Phil. <laughs> you gotta give a call. Well, anyway, anyway, that's it for uh, for, for tonight. It's, that's it for the week. Uh, it's so nice to have you guys around. Really appreciate it. Uh, Charlie Wallace, always a pleasure to have you here. Josh, Fridays are Josh nights, you know. Uh, Kevin, uh, thank you. Thank you, Phil, for deciding to give us a call tonight. Uh, no telling how many other people would have called, but when you called, they decided not to. But we got you there, and I appreciate that. Uh, I think I tell you my COVID story of woe. Yeah, and also uh, thanks to Alan. Thanks to, oh, uh, thanks to Kevin. Hello. And thanks to uh, Vernon and, of course, uh, to Tony. Uh, every one of you, give a big wave goodbye, and I'll give a big wave goodbye at you. There they go, ladies and gentlemen. That's our citizen panel. There they go. Okay, let me just uh, hang up on them here so that we can uh, uh, finish off the program. Anyway, listen, uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We'll be here. Well, uh, Jack Bishop is next with The Intersection. And we'll be back here again on Monday at 4 o'clock on Facebook with our pop-up show. And then you'll be able to watch that after it's been done over on YouTube and uh, also on our uh, uh, gabnet.net. 
And uh, then we'll see you again on next Wednesday at 1030. Same time, same station in life. And in the meantime, as always, if you see her, tell her I love her, okay? And by the way, get vaccinated if you haven't done so. Get a booster if you haven't done so. And uh, wear a mask. That would be awfully nice if you don't do any of those things. See you on Wednesday. Bye, everybody.